Hello, this is Michael Stone, the host of Conversations. We're committed to bringing you leading edge thinkers in the areas of environmental restoration, social justice, and spiritual fulfillment. On our program, we look for positive solutions to local and global issues that leave you touched, moved, and inspired to action. Our weekly guests include local and global experts and concerned citizens working together to heal the wounds that separate, alienate, and marginalize people. My guest today is Peter Sale. He's Assistant Director of Institute for Water, Environment, and Health at United Nations University and is University Professor Emeritus at University of Windsor, Ontario, Canada. He's the author of The Ecology of Fishes on Coral Reefs, Coral Reef Fishes, and Marine Metapopulations. Today we'll be talking about his latest book, Our Dying Planet, An Ecologist View of the Crisis We Face. Peter, welcome to Conversations. Happy to be here. Great to have you here. Let's start out with, in the beginning of the book, you start about what motivated you when you talked to your neighbor to write this latest book, which is a little, a bit, little bit of a departure, but certainly related. Okay. Uh, yes, it was 2005. Seems like a long time ago now. My neighbor and I were mowing our lawns. It was an early spring. We paused to say hello to each other. And I said to him, we're going to have to expect springs like this in the future. And he said, oh, no, you've got it all wrong. And he proceeded to tell me how he had read about climate change in the newspapers and so on and so forth. And as far as he could tell, the majority of climate scientists didn't think this was anything to worry about. And there were only a handful who were saying how serious it was. I realized then that intelligent people reading the media can still get the story completely backwards because, in fact, what he was saying was backwards. And I thought, maybe I could do something to help. I had become increasingly concerned myself, primarily perhaps because I am a coral reef scientist and the environmental crisis is hitting coral reefs very, very hard. And I had seen them change and deteriorate, so I knew that things were going on which were quite major. And as I realized just how bad they were, I became worried that other people didn't seem to see this as a serious problem. Well, two things. One, you've called the coral reefs the canary in the coal mine, and I'd like you to start out talking a little bit about that. But just to say something about the media, you know, as someone in the media, we did a show on climate denial. I forgot the man's name who wrote the book on climate deniers and tracked where the money came from and where it went to disprove or create confusion around the science. And it's, it's very hard. I mean, the information is right there. But, for instance, after Al Gore did the 24-hour thing that he did a few months ago, you remember that? Mm -hmm. And I watched the parts of it, and then the last hour, I wanted to listen to it again the next day, right the day after. Mm -hmm. And I went to Google, and I put in Al Gore, the 24th hour. Before I got to anything positive... There was seven full Google pages of skepticism and outright slander and libel. Right. And I was amazed at not only our corporate media, which, you know, I, if I look at Fox News, I know what I'm going to get and the other mm -hmm. broadcasters who mm -hmm. owns them. But now the fact that they're able to manipulate the placement of things so powerfully on the Internet is frightening. So my question before we get into the coral reefs and the other aspects of it is how do people find, I mean, your book is an awesome overview of this, Our Dying Planet, an ecologist view of the crisis we face. But not everyone's going to read your book. We're in a media-driven society. How do people get through that and find good information. You know, this is something that I'm just learning myself right now because I've written this book. I wrote it for people, not for scientists. I want people to read it. And how do I get it out there? How do I get it so that people see it, so that people talk about it? You're right. There's a huge challenge. The other thing I'll say is a lot of people who dismiss the environmental problems do so out of I think out of fear. It sounds pretty unpleasant. I don't want to think about this. I'll wall it off. So there's a lot of people who 
And we're very good at walling off things we don't want to think about, and then we go on with our lives. A lot of people who don't think it's important don't think it's important because it sounds too terrible. So my thought has been until we get a sizable number of people who see this as a really big problem, we're not going to get the pressure that's going to be needed to get the parade started so that then the media will all flock around and the politicians will all run to the front, and then we'll start making some changes. So the book really tries to explain why it's a big problem, just how big it is, but also point out that there is still time if we make the right changes in our behavior, we can get to a good future. And that's a very positive message. And yes, I've been, people have said, why have you chosen the title, Our Dying Planet? The first thing I say is, well, it's not dead yet, so there's still hope. The second thing I say is, I had to grab people's attention, because otherwise they'd never pick the book up. And yet I want to say to people that this is to pierce the distraction and the other things that are getting to people, but Peter has a very positive message. So as we go through this and we begin to talk about these different areas, stay tuned, because there are solutions. There's not a lot of time, but there are clear solutions once we stand in and recognize that we do have a problem. You know, it's kind of like you can't get to where you want to go unless you know where you are. There was some Chinese philosopher who said the uh, every journey begins with the first step, and we're still dithering about whether we're going to take that first step. Well, my colleagues are in Durban, South Africa right now, and I've kind of given up. I know you're associated with the United Nations, and I've given up on the process to myself and feel like I'm more useful at a grassroots level of getting the people to rise up, to read your book, and to do these things. I personally agree with you. I think the lack of movement in these large international stages, it's very distressing to me. There are a lot of leaders, a lot of senior politicians, a lot of senior policy people in a lot of countries who understand precisely the environmental problems we're facing, but they put it in the too hard basket. And they can get away with that because nobody is pushing them. But they know how bad it is. There are increasing tendencies in some places for leaders to start thinking about, okay, how do I organize things so that my country is going to do okay? And the problem, of course, is we share one planet. Well, let's get into some of the issues here without overpowering it, but starting with the canary and the coal mine, the coral reefs, and into the the fisheries and the forests and atmosphere, and just kind of give us a state of the ecology of these things. And I'm also particularly interested, Peter, because... One of the things I love about your book is you're one of the few people that takes a systems approach to it. So talking about how those different ecosystems interact, I think, is really important. Right. Okay. One of the things I wanted to do with the book was to make the point that we have one big problem, not a bunch of separate problems. Um, there have been lots of books written on climate change. There have been books written on you know fisheries collapse. There's a wonderful little book written exclusively on the collapse of the cod fishery in in the northeast of North America. We deal with these separate issues as if they're truly independent of each other, but they're all related to each other. They're all being caused by what we're doing. And one of the tendencies when you start splitting them apart is people start arguing about which is the most important to deal with. And that is very unproductive because they're all important to deal with. And what we should be talking about is why aren't we dealing with them? Exactly. The problems we have at the present time with the environmental crisis are far worse than the financial problems that we're all struggling through in, well, since 2009. But very much interrelated. I mean, the economy is at the heart of driving the devastation of the environment. The constant need to have growth and consumption is very much interrelated. But from a systems approach, you need to include that too, really. Oh, yes. The issues are not going to be solved without some serious reorganization of economic models. Uh, We have got to get away from the idea that everything can grow indefinitely. We live on 
one relatively small planet all alone, and it's at least in the near part of the universe, it's all alone, it's the only one like it. We have nowhere else to go. We are powerful enough that we are causing very significant damage to the engines which deliver the goods and the services which we ultimately depend upon. And so, you know, this is one of the things I try and capture in the book. I do have chapters specifically on fisheries. I've got a chapter specifically on forestry. And I talk about the issues related to those things, but they all come back to the central issue, which is basically too many of us using too much and using it either too quickly or in the wrong way. And we have got to recognize we cannot do that because we are changing the planet in ways which make it very difficult for us to continue our lives and our civilization. And so, I mean, it's very foolhardy what we are doing. Incidentally, I saw a news release yesterday, FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, has just released a new book, a report on agriculture in the next few years. They say in the in the news release, I've not had a chance to look at the document itself. It's a big, thick book, uh, and it's not online yet. But they say in the news release that there is going to be a need to increase agricultural production by 70% by 2050. That's 39 years away. Yeah. Uh, in order to feed the 9.2 billion people we expect on the planet. They don't say anywhere that this is going to be really, really difficult. I think it's going to be impossible. They simply say you've got to increase it by 70%. And these are really serious problems we're creating for ourselves. And if we don't change our behavior, we're going to be in a in very serious strife. The whole food system, you know, agriculture system that we have right now also is close to being in collapse, too. There's only so many antibiotics you can shove into things and so many petroleum fertilizers and all these things, which we've talked about, of course, on this show. Well, I mean, the the FAO document that I just mentioned, they do itemize the problems. They point out that 25% of the land is seriously degraded by our behavior. And they say that's a problem. But what they don't say is these problems are going to be really, really difficult to deal with if we continue to assume we can go forward business as usual, not worrying too much about it, which is the way we've been going for the, for the past couple of decades. So let's get into the specifics about it. Let's start with the canary and talk about the basic things and how they're interrelated, basic areas of, of foresting and fisheries and land. <laughs> Sure. The the canary metaphor, of course, is a very useful one. The canary you take down into the mine, and when the canary falls off its perch because of carbon monoxide poisoning, you know it's time to get out of the mine. just so happens that canaries are more sensitive to carbon monoxide than miners are. So the canary in the environmental mine, coral reefs are showing real impacts of the things we're doing. I say in the book they are going to, coral reefs as we knew them in the 1970s, will not exist in 2050. That's pretty profound. So they're a canary in the mine. One of the things I've realized since writing the book is they're a canary with a very soft voice. And it's a great pity in a way that we're destroying coral reefs instead of something like eastern deciduous forests of North America, something that people are really familiar with, something that people live with every day. Coral reefs are something most people have never seen them. People who have seen them have seen them once or twice. But I don't think, Peter, that people know. Explain to people why they're so important. You know, I think most people think, oh, they're nice to scuba dive and see the pretty fish, but they don't get the, the reality of what you're talking about. No, and that's true. Now, I'll give you some statistics. 25%, that's a quarter, of all species that live in the ocean live on coral reefs. Now, many of that 25% will be able to live without the reef, but many of them won't. So the loss of coral reefs represents a huge loss in the diversity of plants and animals that live in the ocean. Coral reefs are economically exceedingly valuable to the countries that have them. They provide fisheries and they provide 
tourism. The Great Barrier Reef in Australia is valued at something like six billion Australian dollars a year in revenue. And that's year after year after year. Six billion rolls in each year simply because they have the Great Barrier Reef. A lot of that is in tourism. Some of it's in fishing. Those things are going to be really impacted. Now, I've talked to people who've gone to the Caribbean on vacation and they've stayed in Cancun or somewhere similar. And they said, well, you know, there's lots of tourism there. It has nothing to do with reefs. I know, I know there was a reef out there and some people went scuba diving, but I didn't. And I say, no, but you probably walked on the beach one morning. And they said, yes. And I said, that beach is produced by the organisms that live out on that reef. And without those organisms continuously producing sand, that beach is going to disappear. The tourism is in these tropical countries depends on beaches. Those beaches depend on the reefs and the calcifying organisms that produce that sand. And one of the reasons the reefs are disappearing is because of ocean acidification, which is making it very difficult for calcifying organisms to produce calcium carbonate. Corals on the Great Barrier Reef are now growing 14% slower than they were in the 1980s. So, and that reduction is because it is more difficult for them energetically to build the calcium carbonate limestone skeleton. So they grow more slowly. So, you know, the loss of coral reefs represents a significant economic impact as well as a significant biological loss. It's a very big deal. It's a very big deal, and, and I love in your book you go into great detail. And unfortunately, we don't have time to do that, but yeah. it definitely relates if that much of the coral reef is the habitat for a quarter of the fish. And I think the statistic I remember, I didn't see it in your book, but something close to it, was that 90% of all the large fish are gone from the ocean and that also that we're breaking up the fish that the other fish feed on. Can you talk about overfishing and the impact and how that's, you know, you go from the reef and then the fishing, how is that related and fit into the equation? Well, the overfishing thing is really, I think, quite alarming. If you look at the statistics, and there are good global statistics for the fishery catch per year in every country, talking commercial fisheries here, of course. If you look at the global catch of fish, it has been going down since the mid-1980s, and it's been going down slowly. It's not been going down because we're fishing any less or, or using less sophisticated equipment. We're using more sophisticated equipment. It's been going down because the fish aren't there. There have been studies by fisheries biologists showing that the not just the number of large fish, as you said a minute ago, the total biomass of fish, in other words, the total weight of living fish flesh swimming around in the ocean right now is one-tenth of what it was before the Second World War. Wow. So we have sifted out so rapidly that the fish have not been able to replenish their numbers and we have reduced it by 90%. And when you start talking about large fish, there are many, many large fish that are going to go extinct in the next few years simply by overfishing. And the important thing about overfishing is not so much the fish, but the fact that fish provide 16% of the animal protein that people eat. So if you have a decline in that amount of animal protein coming from fishing, what do you replace it with? And, you know, and I discuss in the book some of the things people think you replace it with, like, oh, we'll do aquaculture. Right. You know? Well, aquaculture produces fish we like to eat by using lots of fish that we don't like to eat. So it doesn't solve the problem. It just means we fish more out of the ocean, and that's contributing to the decline of fishing. And so then you say, oh, well, then we'll have to feed people from land sources. And then you come up with the statistic I mentioned earlier, 25% of the agricultural land in the world is seriously degraded by our agricultural practices. 
In this country alone, we lose an eighth of an inch of topsoil, which may not sound like much, but when you're talking about less than two feet, that's pretty serious. That's significant, and up here in Canada, there's less than you've got, because a lot of ours got pushed south during the Pleistocene. (laughs) So, not only that, so let's take it a little bit further, and noticing that, okay, the fish are also dying because of the amount of CO2 and the water warming up and, of course, the plastic and pollutants that are in the water and the runoff from agriculture. So let's add now the state of the ocean to this mixed equation here. One of the things, you you know, we talked at the beginning about the international large meetings such as the COP meeting currently getting started in Durban. One of the good things that has happened with those meetings in the recent past is that the ocean is finally being noticed. Yes. Up until recently, these meetings have been driven entirely by concerns about degradation of the land. And degradation of the ocean is a serious problem. And there are reports coming out documenting the extent of the pollution, the extent of the overfishing, the extent of the acidification. You know, the acidification is a really interesting one. We burn fossil fuels. That pumps CO2 into the atmosphere. One-third of that CO2 in the atmosphere promptly dissolves in the ocean. Now, we're lucky in a way that it dissolves in the ocean because if it was all up in the atmosphere, our climate would be changing even more rapidly than it is. But it dissolves into the ocean, and when it gets there, it dissociates and forms carbonic acid and shifts the pH of the water very slightly in the acid direction. Now, it's not turning the ocean into lemon juice or anything, but the ocean is slightly more acidic than it used to be. I'm talking about the entire ocean of the world, you know, not just a little bay somewhere. The whole thing, it is more acid than it used to be in the surface waters where things live. And you've done research early on in your work where you went into places where it was not just a little bit, but there was no life left. Yes. Yeah. Well, I haven't done that research myself, but I, when I was up in northern Ontario, that was acid rain, and that's a slightly different situation, but it's a similar, similar kind of problem. Yeah, right. You change the chemistry of the environment, and in changing the chemistry, you make it impossible for some organisms to survive. And this is what we're doing in the ocean. The acidification problem is one that what I focus on in the book is the impact on calcification because so many marine organisms use calcium carbonate as their skeleton where you know it's the corals but it's also the mollusks the crustaceans the starfishes the all sorts of other little things a lot of the worms a lot of the plankton has tiny little skeletal structures made out of calcium carbonate Now, many of these organisms are going to have such serious problems, they aren't going to be around. And so that's a hugely difficult problem, but that's just one of the things that shifting the pH is doing. And people are, I mean, scientists are now starting to get really concerned about how we're changing the chemistry of the ocean. We know that in the past, the ocean has changed in in some very bad ways for for reasons that had nothing to do with us because we weren't here. I'm, I'm thinking of the end of the Permian, which is, you know, some uh, 350 million years ago. It's a long time ago now. But at the end of the Permian, the oceans were changed very dramatically by a lot of volcanic activity, a lot of release of chemicals that seriously altered the acidity of the ocean and some other things The ocean was basically dead for 20 million years. Let's come back today to the temperature change. I don't think another thing that people have trouble getting is what the temperature change in the ocean means to all of us in terms of the weather and food production and fisheries and everything. We're beginning to see the effects. You know, there are a lot of people who heard the news about climate change and the effects on temperature and people talk about one degree, two degrees, maybe three degrees. It doesn't sound so bad. In fact, on a cold winter day, it might yeah. sound quite nice. <laughs> but that sets up all sorts of complex dynamics in the atmosphere, complex interactions between the atmosphere and the ocean. The changes in temperature are altering rainfall patterns. 
so that rain is coming in storms instead of gentle showers. It is coming in different places at different times. You're getting longer periods of drought between periods of rain. Monsoons are moving from where they have traditionally occurred. These kinds of changes are going to have immense effects on people. In Pakistan this yep. year and last year yep. are part of climate change, and it's just the beginning of what's happening. So the Changes that sound so small, a little bit of a shift in pH of the ocean, a little bit of an increase in temperature, it sounds so trivial. When you start looking at it, you realize that these things magnify out and you get some very severe changes. And we're seeing the beginnings of them all over the world. The frequency of large storms, the frequency of droughts, the the fact that tornadoes that used to belong down in Kansas now occur in Ontario, these are changes being caused by the fact that we are insulating the planet with chemicals, particularly CO2, that we're putting up in the atmosphere. It is really serious, and people need to understand just how serious it is. Yeah, and at the end of the show, we will talk about, in a little while, we'll talk about things that need to happen, and I want to get into that, but uh, we haven't talked about deforestation, which is so huge, and, you know, the amount of loss of trees every year and the impact on the growth of CO2 is something like 17%, I, as I remember it was at least right. at one time. Right. Well, you know, one of, the, one of the really neat things about trees is that the amount of photosynthesis they do, and when remember when trees and other plants photosynthesize, they take CO2 out of the atmosphere. The amount of photosynthesis the trees do is sufficient to change the CO2 in the atmosphere. And you can see this every year on the record of CO2 in the atmosphere, which has been recorded continuously on top of Mauna Loa since 1958. And the graph is on the web. It's right there. You can see it. And it goes up every winter and down every summer, just a little bit, because the trees do more photosynthesis in the northern summer than they do in the northern winter. And the trees in the southern hemisphere tend to do their photosynthesizing all year round. They don't drop their leaves, as many of them. And so you have this inequality of how much photosynthesis goes on on the earth in the northern summer compared to the northern winter. And that's sufficient to fluctuate CO2 in the atmosphere. We're, of course, changing it far more dramatically, but don't let anyone ever tell you that organisms can't alter the atmosphere. They can, and trees have been doing it for, for a very long time. Yeah. But no, the, the loss of trees, about 7 million hectares of forest are lost every year. That's net loss, not the amount we clear, but the amount we clear minus what is regrown. 7 million hectares is a big number and it doesn't mean anything to people. That's about 17 million acres. For Yeah, and that's about the size of West Virginia. Mm. And that's a big place. And we lose that amount of forest every year. Now, the forest does lots of things for us. It takes CO2 out of the atmosphere and sequesters it in wood. It produces wood, which is exceedingly valuable for us in our buildings and our furniture and everything else and firewood. The trees also play an amazing role in ameliorating the climate, making the climate less extreme, making the water that comes down as rain soak into the ground instead of run over it and cause erosion and siltation of water bodies and so on and so forth. So there's a whole range of things that trees do for us by being there and we're just getting rid of them a little bit at a time. Oh. Well, I don't want to run out of time here, so yeah. I want to shift a little bit. And before we get into solutions, I'd like you to talk. You have a wonderful couple chapters in here talking about why we don't comprehend the scale of the problem. So I'd like you to, in only a couple minutes, yeah. an impossible yeah. task, talk about shifting baselines and the belief in the balance of nature. And one of the things <laughs> that people have a hard time comprehending is the exponential curve and and how that works in reality. I mean, as a concept, or, or maybe as your savings yeah. account, you can understand it, but not seeming to relate it to what's happening now. 
actually people don't even understand it in their savings account or, or better <laughs> still in their in their credit card debt and you suddenly discover you can no longer pay it off exponential growth is very common and is very frightening when it happens and there are a number of things that are behaving exponentially and we're not very good at appreciating just how serious they are one of these of course is simply the growth of the human population i mean i was appalled at the treatment of the you know the date when the world population reached 7 billion people the, a lot of the presentations of that in the media and and this was spurred by the UN population department that began by identifying selected babies around the world to be the 7 billionth person but then suddenly it was a sort of a celebration I celebrate the birth of all of those babies as individuals belonging to families, but I don't celebrate the fact that there are 7 billion people on the planet. It's not just 7 billion, yeah, and we're projecting 9.2 or 4 by 2050? 9.2 by 2050. Uh, The thing that for me is really hard to hold is of those 7 billion Two-thirds of them live on less than $2 a day, and at least a third of them or more are suffering greatly. That is very true, and you know something else? If those of us who don't live on $2 a day, if those of us in North America and Europe were to all reduce our consumption down to $2 a day, it wouldn't compensate for the extra growth that is going to occur in the next 30 years. The population is growing so rapidly that the problems are still going to become worse even if we reduced ourselves to the level of life experience of an African peasant. And you know that's not going to happen if we can prevent it. We want to lift everybody up. So, yeah, I I didn't write a chapter on population until the very end. I wasn't going to put one in because it's it's political suicide to say anything about it because it's so personal. But I finally decided I had to say something about it. And I remember in Al Gore's film, An Inconvenient Truth, he tried to dramatize the growth of the population. I thought he did a really good job. Oh, with the the lift? But he he had the cherry picker to get to the top of the graph. (laughs) That was good. (laughs) That was a good way of making the point. And yet, even then, people don't really recognize it. So, yeah, I talk about our difficulty of understanding these kinds of things and slow changes are another thing we have a great deal of difficulty with we're we're real good at jumping out of the way of the predator but we're not very good at jumping out of the way of the incoming tide but the other thing that i do talk about in the book which is another one of my pet concerns a lot of people have a lot of faith in the ability of the natural world to take care of itself and repair itself and and if we just stop what we're doing everything will be okay and the fact is it won't the the natural world is not built like that the natural world you know the the idea of the balance of nature is greatly overstated and i try and explain how that is that that is much more fragile and and we should be a lot more frightened because we're we're kind of blundering around like the bull in the china shop and we're going to break things that we need i've been saying to people that this is the biggest environmental crisis we faced since the pleistocene and we are heading rapidly towards what scientists call 6x or the sixth mass extinction and that's Mm -hmm. a whole show in itself to talk about that but i want to get into some things that I think are really important in this book because, you know, some people are probably getting a little depressed at hearing all this. <laughs> and that's okay because when you talk about the four choices for the future, one of them is coming face to face with the problem that it's real and that it's shared by all of us, no matter what your income, color, race, religion, it's shared by every single one of the seven billion people on this planet. So I'd like you to talk about the choices for the future and what gives you hope because i think there are a lot of things to be hopeful about too peter let me talk about the the choices very quickly i'll simply say i created a sort of a a metaphor or a parable and suggested that there were four paths ahead of us and there's one we're going to i think on a eight lane superhighway which is a frightening world in which the rich wall themselves off and protect themselves and the poor become poorer and poorer And I see lots of signs of us heading in this direction. It's not a good direction to go in, and it ultimately doesn't win in the long run. There's a couple of others in between that I'll skip over, but the one I like is the one that 
I call New Atlantis. Don't ask me why, but it sounded good. It's a world in which we have the toys that we love. We have all our electronic gadgets. We have a sophisticated life. We have a rich civilization. We have the arts and theater and the sciences and, and the sports and all the other good things that make our lives as rich as they are, but we do it in a world which is managed sustainably. We don't use fossil fuels. We use other sources of energy. We are far more conscious of the cost of energy so that we use energy sparingly. We are much more economical and we don't waste it. We waste so much energy at the present time. It's just incredible. So a more efficient way of using energy, better sources of energy, a society that works and supports the natural world, which in turn supports the society. And this is doable. Yes. But it is going to take some significant changes in what we do. Moving towards renewable fuels, uh, renewable energy, moving as rapidly as possible. I am so happy that the Keystone XL pipeline was stopped because if it had got built or when it gets built, that will allow the Canadians to double the production from the tar sands, which is the dirtiest, most environmentally destructive kind of oil we have. And I'm so happy that the XL pipeline got delayed, but we've got to get off these fossil fuels. We've got to deal with our population growth. We have got to recognize that just as it is right to encourage sophisticated medicine to make lives long and healthy. It's also right to encourage people to not produce more children than they need to replace themselves. Problem is we're still producing children as if we were living in the dark ages. And as a consequence, we have far too many people on the planet. So we've got to talk about a declining population, not a growing population. And we've got to talk about an economics that deals with that. Let's bring it down for a second because we're running out of time. Yep to what the listener can do. What can the person listening to the show, you know, it's kind of overwhelming sure. for people to confront this, and it's like, yeah, but I only have one child, and, you know, I'm... If everybody had only one child, we'd be in a very different world. But what can the individual do? That's... What can the individual do? Yeah. The individual can be active. The individual can talk about the problem to friends and neighbors, maybe to people who don't already believe it's a problem. The individual can be politically active and put pressure on the politicians to move in the right direction. I was in Australia during the 70s. I talk about this in the book when the attitude to the natural world was summed up in the phrase, if it moves, shoot it. If it doesn't move, chop it down. And that was the view. That was what nature was there for. There was a threat of oil drilling on the Great Barrier Reef. And a tiny little NGO began a campaign with a very simple slogan saying, save the barrier reef. And if they hadn't done that, we probably would not have what is undeniably the best and one of the very largest marine protected areas around a coral reef in the entire world. And the Great Barrier Reef has been well protected and well managed because of a bumper sticker that said, save the Barrier Reef. People change their attitudes, and when people change their attitudes, things happen quickly. Madison Avenue can teach you to want all sorts of things you never dreamed you needed. Madison Avenue techniques can teach you to want a world which is sustainable. So it's doable. It's something that individuals can get involved in. There is room to do things in your local neighborhood to make a local difference, and it's all worthwhile. And I also recommend, the, if you aren't familiar with the Pachamama Alliance's Four Years Go program, it's a wonderful program that links many, many organizations and people together. I've heard of it. I don't know much about it. Yeah, I'll send you a link on it. So my last question to you anyway, and we have about a minute and a half for this, is what gives you hope? What What is it that gives you hope, Peter? I could be real corny and say when I look in my granddaughter's eyes, I have hope. That's um, not corny to me. I have hope because I cannot get my head around one of the most amazing species on Earth, the only species, so far as we know, that is capable of developing arts and sciences, 
capable of thinking into the future, capable of planning ahead. I cannot believe that we, with these abilities, are capable of shooting ourselves in the head, which is what we're currently doing. You know, I loved Thomas Berry and, of course, Brian Swim, kind of the heir apparent, and Evelyn Tucker, and the idea of recognizing that we are a tree's way of appreciating its beauty, a river's way of... When you look at the evolution of consciousness itself, we are at a evolutionary turning point where when we realize that it's all connected, it's all alive, we have developed consciousness and therefore, plus the destruction we've done, we also have developed a level of responsibility that we could solve this problem, we could take it on. And we need to get into that place where we see ourselves as the planet, as part of all of this. So, you know, an apple tree can't think, but it certainly produces uh, something, but we can protect that by the way we're being and recognize that's part of the unfolding of the evolutionary process. Peter, I just want to put another plug in for your book, Our Dying Planet, an ecologist's view of the crisis we face. I've been talking to Peter F. Sale. He also has a website. Yeah, www.petersalebooks.com, one word. Great. Well, thank you so much. I wish we'd had much more time. I I hate skipping over some of these topics because there's so much richness and beauty in them. I really enjoyed it. Well, I will be in touch, and I'll make a note here to send you that link, yes, for four years ago. Thank you. You take care, and I'll talk to you soon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Conversations is an independently produced program supported by KVMR 89.5 Nevada City and listener contributions. We are committed to bringing you leading-edge thinking in the areas of environmental restoration, social justice, and spiritual fulfillment. If you would like to receive our complimentary newsletter, The Well of Light, make a contribution, or order any of our past shows, please call 530-477-7757 or go to our website at arewelistening.net.